welcome to BU Talks, the podcast series where we build our souls as well as our CVs. I'm your host, Emily Liatsis. Today we will be interviewing Dr. Riddell. The Stephen A. Jaroslawski Chair of Undergraduate Teaching Excellence, the 2015 recipient of the 3M National Teaching Fellowship, the Chair of the English Department, and the Chair of the Teaching and Learning Center. Dr. Riddell established QUEC, the Quebec University's English Undergraduate Conference, and various other projects here at Bishop's University. We would like to thank the Experiential Learning Internship Grant Fund, the Bishop's Bookstore, and the Advancement Office for making this podcast series possible. And I would first like to acknowledge the territory on which we hold BU's talks. It is the traditional and unceded territory of the Abenaki First Nations and the Wabanaki Confederation. In performing this land acknowledgement, we make what was invisible visible and invite the land, the First Nations people, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission into our conversation today. Welcome, Dr. Adele. Thanks, Em. Um, so I would just like to start off by asking you, how did you discover bishops? And what compelled you to want to teach at this institution? Well, I discovered bishops when I was an undergraduate student at McGill University. And I went to McGill. I was from Halifax. I thought I was a big city kid. I was delighted to go to Montreal. I was delighted to go to, to McGill. And I was dating a guy who went to bishops. And at McGill, I didn't thrive. I failed to thrive. I got sort of lost in the system. I had giant classes with 600 to 1,000 people. I didn't make any connections with my faculty and my cohort of students. There were just so many of them that it was really hard to build a community. But on weekends, when I came down to visit my boyfriend at Bishops, I lamented every single visit that I should have gone to Bishops because they were in, you know, first name basis with their professors. They were engaging with their community. They were building clubs. They were doing incredible things. And I just thought, you know, I missed the opportunity in my undergraduate. And so when the job came up at Bishops, I was teaching at Concordia. I was living in Montreal. I had just finished my PhD from Queens. And I jumped at it. I thought, you know, if I didn't get a chance to be there as a student, I'm really going to try to be there as a faculty member. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so you're working on a book on teaching and learning called Just Teaching Shakespeare, along with two other recipients of the 3M National Teaching Fellowship, Dr. Lisa Dixon from UNBC and Dr. Shannon Murray from UPEI. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about this project? We know that you're trying to make the contents as accessible as possible. What do you want readers to take away from your book? Oh, this book is one of the most joyful writing experiences of my life. I uh, sat down with these two amazing 3M National Teaching Fellows. They're Shakespeareans. We're the only three Shakespeareans who are also 3Ms. And we met a number of years ago in Vancouver on a bus ride going to the <laughs> Museum of Anthropology when we were there for a conference and we started talking about Shakespeare and we started talking about why we teach Shakespeare, why we teach Shakespeare in the 21st century and why it's still so important and it's so alive and it's so thought provoking, you know, 400 years later. And we started by saying, well, let's present on teaching Shakespeare. And so we presented at a conference and we were, we talked about Hamlet and the three different kinds of approaches that we take in the classroom. And we were so excited and so delighted that we thought we need to write this down and we need to write down the conversations that we have about Shakespeare. And so uh, we call ourselves the weird sisters um, <laughs> from the three Love witches it. from Macbeth because uh, we are kind of weird. We're on the margins. We're on the margins of our discipline and we're on the margins of teaching and learning where we believe that Shakespeare gives us a wonderful opportunity for us to exercise critical empathy, to understand different people's perspectives, to see through different people's eyes, to encounter the other with humility and complexity. So we had to unlearn a lot of the things that we learned in our discipline, because in our disciplinary language, we have to sort of extinguish the joy. We have to take out all of our jokes. We have to be very serious and very cerebral. And that wasn't an authentic voice for us, so we've always felt like we're imposters. And in our teaching and learning, in the research around the scholarship of teaching and learning, it also sucks the joy out of teaching, uh, the delight in the classroom, the rich and generative spaces. They tend to talk about students as data points rather than as living 
breathing, three-dimensional humans. And so we thought, you know what? We're going to write this book. We don't know if anyone's going to read it. <laughs> I think our disciplinary colleagues are going to think we're totally weird and our uh Scholarship of Teaching and Learning colleagues are going to not really get us, but we really needed to find an authentic way to talk about the rich and generative spaces of the classroom via Shakespeare. Wow, that's wonderful. That's so exciting. <laughs> Students obviously come to school to learn, but many of us end up regurgitating knowledge without understanding or diving into deeper thought. You are actively working against this, like you said, with your book. Um, so I have to ask, what does learning mean to you? And how do you ensure that students leave your courses with that deeper understanding? And for how could other professors implement these ideas as well? Those are very good questions. <laughs> I don't know how the answers to them, but I've explored them mm -hmm. in a number of, of ways. And it reminds me of the book that I'm reading and I read at the end of every semester called The Courage to Teach by Parker Palmer. And he said the key to learning and the key to teaching is to go into the classroom brave enough to bear your soul, to have a kind of life of integrity and of wholeness where you take all of the parts of your life and you join them together in your craft, in your discipline, and in the classroom. And it takes a kind of honesty and it takes a humility and it takes an approach that really requires students to be collaborators and partners. And so for me, I always try to model learning, that I'm I'm not a teacher with authority and I don't hide behind my discipline or, or the podium, uh, that I get away from the podium and engage with students, even from the first year, even from an intro to lit class, that uh, you know our students are our collaborators, they're our best collaborators, uh, they're our best learners, they're our best teachers. And so to model that kind of confidence to be able to step away from the podium and the humility to learn and to listen alongside of our students is, is something that's not for the faint of heart. And it takes courage and it takes the confidence of sometimes many years to, to be able to do that and to embody and model learning and failure in a way that's authentic and genuine. So, you know, confronting these questions, whether we're talking about Beowulf, which is an Anglo-Saxon epic, or we're talking about experiential learning and podcasting, to do it authentically is to do it with honesty and to say, hey, we're going to learn together. We're going to create something in the classroom that is unlike any other class that I've taught. The people in the classroom are so unique and so individual that what we make together over the course of the 12th 12 weeks of, over the course of a semester is unique and individual to that experience. And to really equip students with the, the knowledge that they are empowered to direct their own learning course, I think is really important. And that takes a lot of design, a lot of careful thought, a lot of prep, and the ability to adapt to a flexible and changing environment. Amazing. I love that. Um, and that kind of brings me to my next question about CLEC. And so that brings a really special opportunity to students here. Um, so what motivated you to develop and execute such a big project as a brand new professor here at BU in 2009? Um, yeah, what, what motivated you to do that? <laughs> Sheer stupidity. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I'm, I am joking, but I did not realize what I was creating when I created it, which is sometimes the best kind of projects, right? So yeah, totally. <laughs> when I was an undergraduate, I was going to St. Mary's, I bombed out of McGill, I took a year off, I did a lot of soul searching, I moved back in with my parents, I was absolutely focused on finishing my degree, and one of my professors said, hey, maybe you should come to this undergraduate conference. It was a maritime Atlantic Canadian English undergraduate conference. It was at Acadia. It was in 1999, I think. <laughs> I just dated myself. And uh, she said, you should come and you should deliver a paper. And so I did on the 19th century epistolary novel. I still, that's as much as I know about the epistolary novel. <laughs> uh, but I presented in front of my peers and I was exhilarated. I loved every second of it. I thought, you know, we're working on our papers and on our research in such an isolated way. We work on, you know, and write it and write it. And then we pass it into one person 
who is our audience, and they read it, and they give us feedback, and that's it. That is the end of that really wonderful exploratory journey. So when I got to present in front of my peers and I got to ask questions to my peers about their papers, I was delighted. And I vowed that if I had the opportunity, I would build that uh, for you know my own students one day. And so when I arrived at Bishop's in 2009, I, I and I can't believe I did this, but I walked into the VP Academics office, Michael Childs, and I said, hi, I've got this idea to run a conference. Originally, it was just going to be in Quebec, so the Quebec English departments, there are five of them. And uh, he said, have you ever organized a conference? And I said, no. And he said, do you have a budget? He said, no. He said, do you have a proposal? I said, no. He said, I'll give you $1,500. <laughs> and I was off to the races. And so the first year, uh, we accepted every single paper. We accepted all 87 papers uh, with varying degrees of quality and length. And uh, my amazing students trusted me. And we took a leap of faith. I didn't know anybody. I was brand spanking new. Uh, and I got to know members of our community in conference services, in residence, in uh, yeah, admissions, in all of these wonderful departments. And they looked at me and they all looked at me with some sense of disbelief and surprise <laughs> that this Yahoo was, <laughs> was doing this. Uh, and also with, with some kind of curiosity, like who is this person? And I just did it and I did it with my students as partners and together we figured it out. We had the first, you know, welcome reception at my farmhouse. I had no furniture, I had just moved. I had a big house and <laughs> nothing in it, so it was great for a welcome reception. And, you know, nine years later, it's an international undergraduate conference and it is student run, student led. We publish an edited collection of papers. We have the most amazing group of volunteers who from start to finish design, implement and run something that is remarkable. That's wonderful. I love that. So, so I would like to ask you a little bit more about Shakespeare. So obviously you are a Shakespearean. Um, is there a particular text in the world of Shakespeare or literature in general that you personally feel to be of extra relevance to our culture today? That's such a good question. I think Shakespeare is so relevant. His canon of work is unbelievably fresh and vibrant 400 years later. And it's not that he is the man for all seasons, which is what Ben Jonson writes about him in the preface of the first folio in 1616. I don't think that he's universal. What I think is that he's local, that you can adapt and work with the complexity of his plays so that you can make it fresh if you're playing it in Soweto, pre-apartheid South Africa, or you can use it, um, Julius Caesar in Washington, using it as a political allegory, or talking about the ways in which we understand family and the roles of, you know, father in King Lear. So he is local, dynamic, adaptive, dy like just the most wonderful set of complex situations that we can see ourselves in and through. So he creates these plays that are polyvocal, which means that there are multiple voices in a way that I love drama for that. I love drama because it builds that sense of critical empathy in a way that, you know, a poem is wonderful, but it often is from a single perspective or a novel will sometimes have an omniscient narrator. So there's always a voice that guides you. There's a, a kind of author as authority. Mm -hmm. Whereas in drama, over the three hours, meaning is built through conversations amongst the characters on stage. So that it is polyvocal by its very nature, that meaning is only made in conversation, in dialogue. And so you as a spectator watch the world unfold, be created anew when you sit there as spectator through the language of the people on stage. And then you're brought in as a spectator, sometimes you're complicit, sometimes you're a participant, but you are absolutely engaged in a world that is created for the three hours or three and a half hours where you're sitting in live theater. Shakespeare puts you in those uncomfortable situations mm -hmm. where you identify with or you at least see from somebody else's perspective in a way that, that sometimes is deeply uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's really important though, to be deeply uncomfortable because that's how you grow. 
I think so. I think that's absolutely key. There's this wonderful theory called um, threshold theory mm -hmm. where uh, the learning happens, transformative learning happens when you move through knowing like a threshold, that you go yeah. from one state of being to another. Mm -hmm. And when you pass through a threshold uh, and when you learn these kinds of concepts that are bounded, whether they're in your discipline or they're, they're difficult, um, some of the characteristics are that you feel cognitive dissonance, that you feel anxious because you're moving from what is known to what is unknown. And that is actually part of the process. You have to feel deeply uncomfortable. And you can't skip that part, right? It's not a bug. It's the system itself. Mm -hmm. And I think our jobs as educators is to manage that cognitive dissonance in really safe uh, and generous spaces, to name it, to make it visible. Um, and part of the threshold concepts are that what was once invisible is now visible. What is, what is seen can no longer be unseen. Have you had um, a turning point in your life that from transformative learning that mm. there, something happened where you were put in this uncomfortable situation and you were forced to grow? Something that stands out to you that you would like to share? Yes, and I think that one of the things that I try to do is to model spectacular failure okay. and to uh, share with my colleagues and collaborators and students the importance of failure in transformative learning. And so, uh, you know, I mentioned that I went to McGill. I spectacularly failed. Like, I didn't go to class. I had a wonderful time in Montreal, but <laughs> my transcript is littered with withdraws, uh, Ds, a couple of Fs, and really? yes. You would not guess that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I am oh going goodness. to frame my transcript from McGill, <laughs> and then I'm going to frame it next to my transcript from St. Mary's and put it in my office because it really is important for students to understand that your marks are not a reflection of selfhood. I'm, I was the same person. I just had a totally different approach to my learning. Mm -hmm. So I bailed out of McGill and uh, took a year off and did a lot of soul searching. And I had to, you know, work and pay off my debts. And then I went traveling and I went through Southern Africa. And I, like, I did all sorts of things to check my own privilege and to feel ashamed of myself. And then I decided that I was gonna go back to school and I was going to go to law school because I was gonna save the world. And mm -hmm. I, cause I'd seen horrible things in Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. I'd seen horrible things in AIDS orphanages in Soweto. I'd seen just terrible violations of human rights. And I thought, you know what? The best way I can do something about this is to go and get my higher education. I have it, it's available to me. It is a deep privilege. Uh, I have to go and do this. And But my first day was the transformative learning experience that um, that I still reflect on and I still revisit. When I was sitting there on the first day of my fresh start in class, in intro to drama, with that sort of mixed anticipation and hope, but also like, what am I doing here? How did I get here? And I, I'm sitting there and in walks this middle-aged British woman, Dr. Janet Hill. She's got scarves trailing and she's got books hanging out of her bag and she plonks all her stuff down, <laughs> turns around and says, right, who's going to be my Desdemona? And I think she just pointed at me and I levitate, like I just was like, I am under your spell, whatever you want to do, you do. And so she said, okay, come to the front of the classroom, lie down on the ground uh, and pretend you're dead. I thought, okay, I can do this. This is kind of weird, but fine. And I remember lying there, and I remember the feel of the cold linoleum floor. As I look up at this woman who proceeds to recite Othello's Put Out the Light speech as he kills his wife in the final act of Othello. And this amazing middle-aged British woman transforms as Othello, and she delivers this incredible, incredible speech. And she gets up afterwards, wipes the tears away from her face. I got up totally dusty, freezing cold, <laughs> and exhilarated. Like, I felt like I was baptized. I felt like I had totally <laughs> baptized in Shakespeare. Because, and it wasn't that 
anything about Othello resonated with my own life. I'd never had a jealous relationship. I'd never been in that situation. But what I had in that moment was realizing that Shakespeare gave a kind of beauty to darkness and light, um, that he created something that was larger than me, uh, that she, by taking those words, created something larger than, than us. And I just... Dr. Hill, she was absolutely, I'm getting weepy. I'm like, oh. Whoa. she was amazing because she said, you will love this. You will love this experience. You will, you will find something larger than yourself. And I did. And I was absolutely captivated from that moment on. Um, and I took every single Shakespeare course that I could take from her and from another one of my amazing mentors, Goran Stanovukovic, who was fabulous and introduced me to the 16th century and made me love poetry and made me love Philip Sidney and Edmund Spencer and uh, they, the two of them changed my life. That's so incredible and so inspiring and I'm so happy that you talked about failure mm. because I think as students that is one of those things that we are so afraid of and you are a prime example of someone who has overcome that and has thrived and I think that that really carries on that you try to continue that tradition of mentorship that was given to you mm. and you try to give that to all of your students and I think that is just absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And there's this there's this amazing moment in As You Like It, mm -hmm. Shakespeare, and uh, we always quote the speech that Jacquees delivers in Act 2, Scene 7 about the, you know, the seven stages of man. But right before Jacquees gives this speech, right before he gives his sort of um, meta theatrical account of life, which is very pessimistic. Mm -hmm. There's this incredible moment where Duke Signor, who has been exiled, who is living with his his court in the forest, they become vegetarians. They don't even kill deer anymore because they believe that everybody should live in harmony. Um, he has this moment where he um, sees a man carrying an older man onto the stage, and he says, "You know, we all live our own." pageants we all live our own spectacles and some are harder than others and it's that exhortation for us to understand that other people are also struggling that they also have challenges that they also have deep joys and delights and he reminds us in that moment that we should be exercising critical empathy that we should be valuing everybody as an end of themselves not as a means, not as a player in your own life, but as complete souls with their own complete pageants and dramas and spectacles, um, and to honor that and to honor the importance of that. What do you think about the relationship between the cultural production, reproduction, evolution of this kind, um, and our developing social sense of self in modernity? Um, and with the technology, with technology and its communicative means, do you think this changes our story, the stories at all? Um, that, that's a couple questions there. Those Sorry. are really good questions. And I think um, that <clears throat> I'm just teaching a, an art of rhetoric class for the first time. And I'm teaching it this semester. And I'm loving it because we're going back to Plato. And we're reading, you know, the Apology. So we're reading Socrates' defense of himself. And we're reading... Aristotle's rhetoric and Cicero's De Oratore and we're reading Shakespeare and one of the things that I have found so remarkable and so earth-shattering for me and, and I'm coming to these texts as an early modernist, as a Shakespearean, through the lens of literature, is that we're trying to sometimes reinvent the wheel or to create things anew when some of the wheels weren't broken, right? Mm -hmm. So the concepts, I've been inviting a, a lot of my colleagues in to give guest lectures. And so, you know, Jamie Crooks, who's amazing and dynamic and wonderful to come and talk to us about Plato and to talk to us about uh, the strategies that Socrates uses to defend not himself, but to defend philosophy and to defend philosophy as something that protects society that doesn't ask questions to deconstruct society but to to protect the virtues and the truth and justice these you know basic essential things that we understand as the foundation of a democracy 
and how relevant that is for us today as we see various democratic institutions under siege. And so then, you know, Dr. Bruce Gilbert comes in and he's also a philosopher and he introduces us to Aristotle and the ethics behind uh, rational thinking of reason. And, you know, he tied Aristotle to the Me Too movement and to Black Lives Matter in a way that we finished the class and I had tears in my eyes. I thought, this is the most beautiful paradigm for us to understand. And what he said was, in Aristotelian ethics, there has to be something above power struggles, that, that the world has to be more than just people using power to coerce or seduce, that there has to be something higher and more meaningful. And that is ethics, that is, uh, moral philosophy that is looking for a kind of truth or reason that we together can be larger than ourselves. And he said the key, the thing that Aristotle was really arguing was that we have to get to a point, we have to use our reason, we have to follow a, a kind of contemplative life where we treat people as ends to themselves or nature as end to herself. So to go into nature and not to look around and say, I will cut down these trees, right? That is using nature as an instrument. That is using it as a means for your own wishes or desires. Mm -hmm. But to, to revel in nature and the beauty as an end of itself and to, to confront and interact with all people, understanding that they are their own telos. They are their own end. They are their own person without using them for our own desires, for our own wishes, for our own interests, but to to treat everybody as an end of themselves is the highest form of rational thought. And it is above the sort of power struggles. It is above coercion. It is above seduction. And I just thought that is, that's the key. Like that unlocks so many things. It's so elegant in its simplicity that we must treat, and that is empathy, right? Mm -hmm. That is understanding. That's what Duke Senior is saying, like understand people as ends of themselves. Uh, and I just, you know, I said to Bruce at the end of class, I said, you need to teach everybody <laughs> on their first day of their first semester that, and you, we need to remind people of that all of the time because mm -hmm. if you treat people as ends of themselves and not as means, you don't, abuse them, you don't harass them, you don't do violence to them, you don't treat them as second-class citizens, you value their fundamental human rights. Um, we, you know, we do that in a really meaningful way. So, so that is 2,000 years old. Shakespeare is exploring that 400 years old. He's pretty fresh and contemporary, but, you know, if we go back to these incredible thinkers who've been asking these questions for thousands of years, we get really powerful answers, and I think we get answers that we can then move forward in our own lives with clarity, with a more refined and more nuanced lens to understand ourselves and our place in the world. So do you, do you believe that uh, if you read more, you're a better person? <laughs> <laughs> I think that that is dangerous because you know I think that you the more you read the more you realize how little you know mm -hmm. and I think that's what Socrates says in in Plato's the apology right he says that the more uh, you think you're wise the less wise you are mm -hmm. that the true uh, person is one who who realizes he or she doesn't know anything and then asks questions and then models learning in really important ways. So I think that that reading is, is a portal. Uh, it's a way of exercising critical empathy. It's a way of occupying other people's perspectives. It's a way of confronting and navigating complexity. But I think it's always the most humbling experience, if you do it right, mm -hmm. um, to realize that you don't know anything. <laughs> and that or you know like the tiniest little piece of something and you have a glimmer into the vastness of knowledge and of thought and of thinking and I think that 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 appetite for reading that desire to occupy other people's perspectives with generosity and grace is essential so we grow when we read so with the growth of online media and the decline of attention spans like um 
do you think that this is harmful to reading and to students in both academic and reading for pleasure? Do you think that that growth of online media and the lack of attention spans because of like YouTube and stuff like and Netflix do you, that really gets in the way? Do you believe that to be true? I'm always suspicious of mm -hmm. the narrative like kids these days, right? Mm -hmm. I'm always very cautious about that uh, because the narrative kids these days could be applied in the 16th century to the drunken apprentices running amok in London. Mm -hmm. You know, and they go, the kids these days, they're just <laughs> not respectful enough. Or the undergraduates at Oxford who are brawling and breaking benches in the 1600s. So, you know, we, we tend to replicate these narratives uh, conveniently, and I think that we need to deconstruct them and to, to play with them a little bit because I find that my students are so engaged and alive and vibrant and curious and uh, absolutely inspiring. I don't find that the attention spans are lower. I don't find the, the level and the rigor of their engagement to be diluted. I think that, in fact, in these kinds of major social movements, this generation has a kind of language that we didn't have mm -hmm. even 20 years ago. Uh, you know, I think about the Me Too movement. I think about enthusiastic consent. I mm -hmm. think about safe spaces. I think about those things where in the popular media, they're talking about this generation as snowflakes. And I'm like, uh-uh, no way, <laughs> no way. There is nothing snowflakey about you unless the snow accumulates in Canada and you're a big friggin avalanche of awesomeness because I just and I get really mad about it because I think you know what you have a language to navigate your world in more humane and ethical ways than we did even in the 80s and the 90s and I am I'm quite offended by the caricature of this generation because I don't see it. it anybody who spends any time in a classroom realizes mm -hmm. that you are dynamic and amazing and thoughtful and reflective and dynamite and you are the hope for our future. You're going to save us from the environment and from <laughs> the economy and from all of the things that we messed up. You're going to you're going to do it and I have absolutely every hope and faith that you will so I'm yeah I want to deconstruct those narratives and I want to challenge anybody who talks about snowflakes to actually spend a day on a university campus oh please thank you I'm tired of reading those articles so gonna go to one of our last questions and this is the question that everyone wants to know the answer to Dr. Adele oh dear every <laughs> single person wants to know what fuels you how do you do it you do so many things how like like what what like mentally physically like what do you eat like are there special <laughs> vitamins like what is it we need to know <laughs> you know i think that uh the source of my energy and this is going to sound super corny is my students is my collaborators. Of course. <laughs> and and I do, but I really believe that, you know, everything that I do has to be student-centered, student-driven. Mm -hmm. That students are my favorite collaborators. They're the people who are the most joyful, the mo the bravest, the most innovative, the the young geniuses. There's this amazing book called uh, The History of Innovation. And in it, the author says that there are uh, two kinds of innovators. There's the young geniuses, and then there's the old masters. And the old masters are the ones that we always think about as, as innovators. So if you think about Rembrandt, he spent 40 years playing with the quality of shadows in his paintings. And he did it over and over and over again. He did a kind of performance feedback revision. He kept doing those loops. He practiced and practiced and practiced for years before he mastered the quality of light in his paintings. And so those old masters are many years in the making and they're usually <laughs> old bearded white guys and ladies who are masters of their craft. But there's also the young geniuses and the young geniuses are the precocious people 
who are brave enough to put things together in connections that that people who are old masters have lost the ability to do so. And so Einstein said, if you don't come up with your best theory in physics before the age of 30, you're done. You're finished. And we always think of the picture of Einstein. You know, he's old. He's got his cute little sweater. He did all of his amazing things before he was 30 because he was a young innovator, because he put unusual combinations together in new and novel ways. And so I always think about my relationship in teaching and learning with students to I'm, I'm going to get to the point where I maybe will be an old master at some point. <laughs> Um, but I am trained in my discipline, so I don't necessarily have the ability to make those really wacky and wonderful and unorthodox connections. But students do. They're the young geniuses. They're like, well, let's put you know, Derrida and deconstruction alongside Beowulf and see what happens. And you do, and bam, something <laughs> magical happens. And you think, I never thought about it that way, or that's absolutely incredible and fresh or that didn't work but really good try that was very interesting and so I think that 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 combination of old master and young genius of those collaborations of the richness of those kinds of collaborations uh, whether that's us doing an international undergraduate conference or whether that's us doing a podcast class you make me braver by putting connections together that I wouldn't. And I just go along for the for the ride, for the sheer delight of it. Uh, I am buoyed up by the enthusiasm. And, and in that way, I recharge in collaboration. I go to the classroom. Like if I spend a number of hours during a week in meetings, I have to go back and plug into the classroom as my source of energy as my like battery <laughs> recharge where I go okay yes this is this is fresh and this is the first time for you and this is the first time for me with you encountering these ideas and I think that that is something that is sustainable energy so it never gets boring for you because it's always brand new it's no always brand new it's and it, it's always <laughs> the combination of like exhilarating and terrifying <laughs> <laughs> I love that well, I think that's a wonderful place to end. I would like to thank you so much for joining us on BU Talks. And um, is there anything that you would like our audience to know before you, we finish? I would like to mark the, the amazing thing that is BU Talks as a student-run, student-driven experiential learning course that I would never have been able to do except for Em and Ethan coming to me last semester and being like, hey, we kind of want to do some podcasts. You want to do some podcasts? I said, I don't know anything about podcasts. I know nothing about podcasts. I say, that's okay. We do. You need to create the space and we will do it. And I just have learned so much from you and Ethan and from the entire class in ENG 454 about the, the kind of grace and quality of your thinking and reflection and research. It has just been awesome. It has totally recharged my battery. I am now completely a fan of podcasts and <laughs> of all of the members of our of our class. And I just can't wait to see what the final product is. And I can't wait to hear what my colleagues have to say on BU Talks. I'm really, really excited to hear them reflect on, you know, their their role in transformative learning, that, that sort of concept of building your soul you know, that we, we do in higher education. We don't name it. We don't make that visible. But where are the moments where you build your soul in addition to building your CV is something that we do so well at Bishops. And, you know, students are building our souls as professors. So I think that's, that's absolutely remarkable. And I commend you and the entire team on this project. Well, we couldn't do it without you. And thank you so much for giving us this opportunity, Dr. Riddell. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us on BU Talks. See you next time. If you would like to learn more about Dr. Riddell's amazing work, please visit her website, www.jessicariddell.com. Thank you. Somewhere